Hello and welcome to Dialogue. New Chinese ambassador to the U.S. Xie Feng has arrived in the country this week to assume office, filling the position after months of vacancy. And the U.S. President Joe Biden suggested a thaw very shortly in terms of engagement with China. At the same time, China investigated and imposed bans on U.S. semiconductor company Micron Technology. Are the relations to improve anytime soon? Will the two countries be able to resolve their thorny issues so as to help stabilize the most critical relationship in the world? To further examine the ties between the two countries, I'm glad to be joined by Professor Huang Jin, Director of the Institute of the U.S. and the Pacific Studies in Shanghai International Studies University, Howard Zodan, Senior Fellow at Center for China and Globalization, and Bram Becker, author and show host of the socialist program on Breakthrough News. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to Dialogue. Uh, on his arrival in Washington, actually in the U.S., in New York, I would say, uh, Huang Jing, the new Chinese ambassador, Xie Feng, uh, sent out two messages. You know, he's, uh, he said he's here to defend, to safeguard the interests of China, and he's there to enhance China-U.S. exchange and cooperation. Uh, I mean, it's rare to see the Chinese ambassador, Chinese officials being so open, I'm here to defend the Chinese interests. Uh, of course, you know, he has a rich experience in terms of uh, affairs related to China-U.S. relationship. So we are expecting better communication uh, between the two countries. I think, yes, if you compare his arrival in the speech with uh, his predecessors, uh, now the minister of Qinggang, when Qinggang arrived in the United States about a year and a half ago, he said, I'm here trying to maintain uh, uh, a stable, productive uh cooperative and manageable relationship between the two countries. But now, obviously, the top priority for Xie Feng is to safeguard China's interests, which means that he tried to build up a kind of communication and cooperation, if possible, on the equal footing with the United States. Basically, we are equal. And uh, of course, uh, it is uh, quite, you know, um, it's good. I, I mean, it's quite understandable for ambassador as a top representative of China and the United States to safeguard China's interest. But for him to speak out, like you said, straightforward like this, uh, is, uh, is quite, uh, in my view, unprecedented. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Harvey, you know, so uh, like, you know, with appointment uh, now, we know that there's uh, several months of, uh, you know, vacancy of the ambassadorship here. Now the, the new ambassador arriving in D.C., uh, what's the prospect uh, of, let's say, communication, uh, channel of communication between the two countries? Well, um, the new ambassador, as you said, has a wealth of experience dealing uh, with the United States. And I, I actually, I was reminded in his remarks about what uh, Secretary of State Blinken uh, said early in his term about relations with China, that competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and adversarial, you know, when it must be. So I think that kind of sums up China's uh, relations uh, as well with the United States. I think the new ambassador has his work cut out for him, though, because the knives are out for China in the Congress. No issue in America uh, unites the whole country uh, like being against China. And so the ambassador is going to face significant amount of headwinds, but I believe because of his experience and his skill that he's going to uh, do the best job he can. And I think that he'll try to uh, open up uh, a dialogue that's uh, needed, uh, especially after the last few months and the last few years. So I'm uh, cautiously optimistic, I think you could say. Cautiously optimistic. Brian, you know, given what uh, Harvey has said, uh, you know, if in particular, I guess, the, the Congress, you know, there's, a, you know, to be frank, uh, the, the anti-China sentiment is really strong and high. And when it comes to the branch of the administration, uh, can we see, you know, the, the, probably the White House is ready probably to talk to, to the ambassador and to the Chinese side to improve um, or to stabilize, if not improve, the relationship? I mean, I think if we look, if we look at the situation objectively, starting with the first meeting between Blinken and 
Jake Sullivan and their counterparts uh, in China back right in the beginning of the Biden administration in Alaska, we have to come to the conclusion that the Biden administration, the Biden White House and the State Department itself has been a primary generator of the animus and hostility towards China. And the increasing tensions that have been created have been created deliberately uh, with a forethought on the part of the administration. So what we see in Congress and reflected in the US mass media is not simply a pressure on the Biden White House, it's been generated by the Biden White House. Uh, this was a deliberate policy. And I think the Biden administration has taken a very aggressive steps, more aggressive than any other US administration since Nixon came to China, since the signing of the Shanghai communique to ramp up tensions and to try to block uh, by, by means of economic coercion, uh, China's uh, continued rise as an economic force, uh, China's decision and priority to grow economically and to expand its own peaceful relations and economic relations with others. So the Biden administration is now facing blowback because the Chinese have stood up uh, and, and are taking, it. they didn't want to have animosity, they didn't want to have increased tension, but they're compelled to take these very strong positions. So I'm not, I'm not optimistic. Uh, I think the Biden administration has been set back somewhat and wants to talk now and talk nice, but they're responsible for this uh, current situation. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Huang Jing, yes, we will come back to this, um, you know, at least a change of tone, it seems, uh, you know, uh, to be from the Biden administration. But anyway, look forward. Uh, the, the, the ambassador, Xie Feng, said that, uh, quote, I remain convinced that a, a sound and stable China-U.S. relationship benefits both countries. So what's your take of, uh, you know, uh, his remarks? Of course, I, I do agree with Ambassador Xie Feng that a good relationship between the United States and China is good for both uh, countries and both peoples. But reality, just like uh, my colleague just said, is that there is a consensus on a kind of a bashing China or anti-China in both Republicans and Democrats. And also the Biden administration, since it came to power, uh, has adopted quite a few policies against China because it said, like Blinken said at the very beginning, that uh, a major part of the China policy is is uh, is to uh, compete or outcompete out China. In that regard, I think that the, the, the and, and it is very, I'm, I'm not sure that we can really improve the US-China relationship uh, in a kind of fundamental way, even though, of course, President Biden just said he wants the relationship to be improved. But another reason, another factor in this is that the Biden administration is not a very strong administration. Actually, it's very weak. What it wants, what it wishes to do is quite different from what it's capable of doing, and uh, especially after the midterm elections and now the, the, the relationship with Congress. So I think that uh, the problem right now is that if Biden administration can deliver what it wants to, even though it may want to improve the relationship between the two great powers. Mm -hmm. uh, Harvey, I want to have your opinions. You know, of course, we uh, have witnessed in recent, uh, you know, like uh, several uh, you know, weeks from the U.S. side, you know, senior officials talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, see trips to China or possible trips to China, improving or stabilizing ties between the two countries. And recently, President Biden said that, you know, he believes a thaw uh, in relationship uh, will come very shortly. Uh, are you that optimistic? I'm, I'm wondering what President Biden is talking about because he faces so much congressional bl blowback on anything positive that he does uh, about China. You know, maybe uh, now that the Chinese and American trade officials are gonna meet at a high level, Maybe, but it's unlikely that there could be some long shot relaxation of uh, trade. You have to remember that uh, President Trump imposed very draconian tariffs on China and Biden has continued them. But now, especially after the G7 on the weekend, it's hard to see any breakthroughs, uh, however welcome that, you know, that they would be. 
All I know is that we sorely need confidence building measures and have to start communicating, as my other colleagues have said just a few moments ago, we have to start communicating better on issues where our national interests overlap, like climate change, global public health, and even now, a new one, the promise and perils of AI, artificial intelligence, because computers are starting to show signs of thinking for themselves. So we have a full plate that we should be addressing, but we're putting our energy still too much into criticizing each other, and that's not good. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brian, uh, we, earlier you mentioned about the, you know, the White House or U.S. side is somehow you know, compelled to, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure which word to use, either change or shift the tone simply toward China. At the same time, we are seeing uh, increased, let's say, increasing uh, communication. For example, the Chinese Commerce Minister, uh, Wang Wen uh, will meet his uh, U.S. counterpart in D.C. and also Catherine Tai, the trade representative in Detroit. Uh, so at least in trade section, tell us more about your understanding and how, in what way China has stood out the, the U.S. compression probably, and then that forced Washington probably to recognize or to compromise with the reality? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the Chinese position has been increasingly assertive because to do otherwise would be really a sign of weakness on the part of China because uh, un, I mean, there's nothing matching the U.S. animus towards China inside of China. There's not like the legislative branch and the other parts of the uh, Chinese system of governance that are uniting to, you know, every day make damning speeches about the United States, to insist that there can never be real economic relations, to insist as U.S. politicians are doing that the that the worst mistake that the U.S. ever made was to, quote, let China into the World Trade Organization. I mean, these inflammatory, belligerent statements uh, become a self-fulfilling prophecy in the years after the U.S. Uh, has decided to make major power conflict uh, its top priority. Uh, first, that was identified as such in the Pentagon Doctrine in, 19, in, in 2018. And then almost without debate, all of the different sectors and institutions of, inst uh, of power in America have adopted the same theme, that we must be adversaries fundamentally. And yes, there can be a thought from time to time, but it doesn't, it doesn't derail the basic concept that we're basically enemies. And this is such a fundamental ch uh, change in the last 10 or 15 years. And again, without debate, like, is this a good idea? Is this smart? Should the U.S. be ramping up for competition and, and conflict with China in all spheres. I mean, I think most American people actually don't want that, but their voices are unheard uh, in, in the middle of this very intense anti-China chorus. Mm -hmm. uh, speak of that, uh, in Harvey, uh, recently, I think the CEO of Nevada, the U.S. semiconductor company, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, he speak in an interview, uh, he said that uh, probably he questioned the, the, the wisdom of the U.S. Uh, pressure or the U.S. practice of banning export of advanced chips to the Chinese side. Uh, he said basically that's created an opening for the Chinese side to be more self-reliant uh, and uh, to do research and you know, produce their own advanced chips. Uh, I want to know, you know what was your take on that? Well, my, my take is that necessity is the mother of invention. And if the U.S. Uh, and its allies, whether the allies are willing or cowed by the United States, um, China has to uh, do more to be self-reliant. And it is doing more to be self-reliant. And I think an interesting case in point is Huawei. Look, President Trump started to demonize Huawei and uh, even had uh, the Huawei CF CFO, the, the daughter of the founder, arrested at the same time that Trump was having dinner with Xi Jinping at the G20. So that's, that's pretty bad. And, and Huawei has been blocked by having uh, access to U.S. technology, to uh, microchips and things. So what did Huawei do when the Americans thought they were going to destroy it? Huawei changed course and used its 5G technology to come up with very innovative solutions and is 
doing much better now than before when the U.S. thought that they would uh, would kill it. So I think that because necessity is the mother of invention, that China is prepared to meet these challenges. But I don't see a world that's completely decoupled or it, or even uh, de-risked uh, completely, because we, we live in a globalized world. We can't operate uh, be, with walls between us. So I believe that we're going to get along as best we can, and we have to if there's going to be any future for our children and for our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Huang Jing, uh, you know, speak of the de-risking, you know, the phrase has become popular, uh, at least, you know, especially in the West. Uh, um, the G7 statement, for example, uh, they are trying to adjust their China policy from one of decoupling to one of de-risking. What, what's the difference then? What, what's de-risking and what are the risks? Can they do that or will they do that simply, you know, talking about de-risking, but actually it's still decoupling? I think de-risking is just this new a uh, political rhetoric or new terms that I do not believe even the people in Washington, D.C. or the Germans who uh, invented this term really understand what it is or they have a, a kind of a, a consensus of what de-risking really is. If de-risking means that in terms of security issue, China is not a country that posted all the military forces all over the world. China is not a country that has a military base basis all over the world, you know, uh, why China is a threat to anybody else. Even in terms of uh, economic uh, threat, that is even more funny because just like the pre previous uh, colleague said, globalization, economic globalization is not a result of any country's policy or strategy. It was driven by market forces because market forces always want the most sufficient distribution of resources or the highest rate of production. And, and the highest, uh, you know, profit. It's the market forces are driven uh, globalization. I do not believe United States can really do with all the wars built up around itself, because like I said, we all live in a very much globalized world, especially if you ask me what is the most globalized industry too, number one, finance or capital, number two, high tech. I mean, this is a, the fact that I, but now we do see some, just we discuss some senior officials of United States, including President Biden, want to so-called improve relationship with China because two common ground emerged between the two countries. Number one is a financial, a global financial stability. And number two, perhaps, is a management of this very fast developing uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I think the, the two countries do have responsibility and the common interests uh, to manage both of them uh, it, because it is very, very important areas for, for human beings as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Huang Jing, you know, I wonder how do you characterize the Chinese response so far you know, over the past couple of years uh, since Donald Trump was starting uh, this, uh, this trade war uh, on China. And recently China has imposed bans on the U.S. company Micron Technology. Uh, is it an isolated case or, you know, is that, you know, some would say that's the Chinese retaliation against, uh, of course, many more U.S. sanctions on the Chinese side? I think this entire thing is a computational rivalry. It's initiated uh, by the American side, uh, first by Donald Trump and reinforced the more systematic by the Biden administration. Everybody can say that China always want to maintain a good relationship. China does not, did not, and uh, will not as an initiate any uh, conflicting with the United States. But China as a big power with its own interests have to defend its uh, interests. So I think right now, China's attitude is very simple. China does not initiate any confrontations, conflict vis-a-vis -vis United States, but China is not afraid standing up against the United States, because China does have its own interest defense. About this micro, of course, uh, what China did is many, if compared to what the United States did, is, is just the minimum, because micro did uh, do something that against China's interests. This is obvious, as evi a very, uh, uh, not a lot of evidence shows that. But United States, we just talk about Huawei and all those companies on the list of United States to, to boycott or I'll try. I think that, uh, you know, we know where the blame should be put. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I do not believe United States can have this kind of hypocritic or double standard carry on while try to uh, claim that it's a, it's a victim. I think that's really a little bit ridiculous. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, Brian, you know, the, uh, there's a talk of, uh, or reports saying that the U.S. side uh, uh, seeking meeting with the Chinese defense minister uh, on the sideline of the Shangri-La dialogue upcoming in uh, Singapore. Uh, and then there's a contradictory uh, signal, uh, you know, coming out from different U.S. department. You know, uh, I think the White House said that uh, the U.S. will lift sanctions on the Chinese defense minister. And then there's a denial from the State Department. So what's happening in this regard? Yeah, it's kind of like the United States has decided we're going to talk and fight at the same time. And I think the talk is largely, in a way, kind of camouflage. Like the U.S. imposes sanctions uh, wrongly on the, sec on the, on the defense uh, leader in, in China and then says, but perhaps we'll lift uh, the sanctions as if that's a goodwill gesture when those sanctions should have never been imposed. And so you have a kind of a hardball bullying kind of diplomacy where the bully says after they punch you, but well, let's talk, let's talk, let's, let's think about what we can do to improve relations after they just punched you in the face. So is it really a, a goodwill gesture or is it designed really to keep China sort of off balance? And I think there is a little bit of um, fear on the part of the Biden administration that this extreme animus and hostility and open brazen hostility towards China on so many levels has a geopolitical uh, outcome too, where it pushes China closer and closer to others who the US also considers to be adversaries, like in, in, in particular Russia. And you can see the Russian Chinese statements after the G7 uh, that is obviously concerning to the United States because the United States would like to separate China from Russia at the moment that the U.S. has decided to try to weaken both countries. So there's a geostrategic, geopolitical uh, focus here, not simply economic and simply not related to and not only related to U.S.-China relations, but sort of a global geostrategic uh, presentation me being made by Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Harvey, as Brian said, uh, well, the U.S. side is trying to play both sides. Uh, but then, you know, of course, uh, they has been pushing for uh, talks for the so-called smooth communication, communication channels here. But then, you know, the Chinese side of the concern is like, what, um, you know, are we going to talk about? Uh, uh, probably it's simply for, you know, talk for talk's sake. Uh, what, what are the substantial issue? Or is there any readiness to make any concessions? For example, lifting sanctions on the Chinese products? I mean, low hanging fruit for both sides probably to pick here? It, it's not obvious. But, you know, Biden gave us a hint uh, in the press conference about uh, uh, some kind of relaxation uh, in uh, U.S. activities against China. So I think we're all waiting to see what he's going to do. But you're right. In order to continue to have dialogues, it's not good just to meet and not make any progress, or it's not good to just meet and just scream at each other or, or talk past each other. So we need to start by having a conversation about things where our national interests overlap. And as I said before, these uh, include uh, things like the environment, global public health, uh, the good and bad of AI, and, and so on. And we're not having those conversations enough. And so in some ways, we're not seeing the forest for the trees. And I think uh, we both need to get serious and go back to where we were before Trump screwed things up when our relationship was quite good, when we had strategic and economic dialogues. We're not going to have those dialogues anytime in the near future, but we need to have starting to have some kinds of dialogues and on some kinds of issues where we can move the ball forward because we're the two most powerful countries in the world. The wor we owe it to the world to do something. Mm -hmm. Uh, Huang Jing, you know, one of the top issues between the two countries is the Taiwan question. Uh, recently, U.S. Admiral John Aquilino, uh, commander of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, uh, said uh, in a speech that the China-U.S. conflicts are not inevitable. U.S. policies related to Taiwan have not changed, and the U.S. does not seek an independent Taiwan, uh, quote, unquote. 
but he said, you know, we are still seeing, um, you know, at the same time from the Chinese side, the concern is that we are still seeing, you know, arms sales to Taiwan, and of course, the U.S. is building the higher level trade ties with Taiwan. Uh, this is also, you know, uh, the concern related to the issue. Uh, at the G7 summit, also in a statement, they talked about, uh, they said they have not changed their policy on Taiwan. They still stick to this one China policy. Had the U.S. shifted or changed its policy regarding Taiwan? I think that uh, it doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you do. I think in recent years, we see that two very dangerous tendencies regarding Taiwan, uh, U.S.-Taiwan policy. One is that the United States seems to slime the, the salami, right, a little by little, not only increase the both volumes and quality and quantity of the arms sale to Taiwan, but also uh, quite a few things which are unsinkable now become reality. For example, Pelosi visited Taiwan, the number three person in U.S. Uh, you know, government. When so McCarthy just met with uh, Tsai Ing-wen, and also Tsai Ing-wen has visited the United States and so on and so forth. So all of this, of course, is kind of almost cross the line of one China policy. But now you said, OK, we don't want to fight. We don't support Taiwan independence. Uh, but um, meanwhile, you did a lot of sense that cross, uh, almost crossing the line. And that's one. Another one is that what to me is very dangerous is it seems Congress seems to be more and more active in Taiwan policy, in the making of Taiwan policy. In other words, Congress is pushing the White House on Taiwan policy. It's adopted quite a few laws in the past few years on Taiwan, which is very, very dangerous. I do not see the capability or even willingness of the White House to contain the Congress, which, of course, is very dangerous in that regard. We always, always say that bad cop and a good cop. But what if the good cop fail to manage the bad cop? So like my colleagues in the in, in United States, we may sleepwalk into a war on the Taiwan issue. It's very dangerous. In other words, you cannot just keep playing with fire while saying, oh, I don't want the fire, but you just keep playing the fire. I think the ball, like in the larger picture, the, the relationship between the United States and China, the ball is in Washington, D.C. now. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, uh, well, the ball is in Washington, D.C. in terms of the Taiwan question. Uh, you know, obviously, for the Chinese side, it's, very, it's impossible for any Chinese government to back off on the you know, territorial integrity or national sovereignty issue. Do you think there's a, there's a proper understanding of that uh, position in D.C.? Um, I don't know if there's a, quote, understanding of it, but the nexus of U.S.-China relations since 1972 was a recognition that Taiwan is part of China, that the ultimate status of Taiwan will be decided by the people on both sides of the Taiwan Straits. Uh, President Nixon uh, said that in the Shanghai communique, it was reaffirmed by Jimmy Carter in 1979 with Deng Xiaoping. It was reaffirmed with a third communique. It's the bedrock of U.S.-China relations. It's fundamental. It's a foundation. And now if you listen to people in the U.S. Congress, it seems like the U.S. is preparing right now to go to war to protect and defend Taiwanese independence. Those two things don't go together. Uh, China can't carry out aggression against a part of China. And yet this, uh, this language has been shifted such that consciousness has shifted inside the United States. And I don't think we're going to see that change anytime soon. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.